Well, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's lovely to be here. I was just walking um, through the halls of the uh, State Library after seeing the beautiful exhibition that the professor has um, curated. And uh, looking up to the closed stairwell where Queen's Hall is no longer open and reflecting on the many, many um, hours and weeks that I spent there uh, doing my fine arts studies uh, up in the beautiful hall and hearing the great news that it's going to be renovated and finally reopened. I'm thrilled about that. Um, so that sort of closes a bit of a circle for me. Professor, good evening. Thank you for agreeing to be in conversation. Please, Sasha. <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm too schooled in the, in the old school ways of, you know, all the right, degree and how, and how I had to treat right, then, my, Virginia, that's fine. my elders and betters, so you, you won't get that out of me. Um, S.T. Gill stands for? Samuel Thomas Gill. We're going to do this a little chronologically, which can be a, a bit dull, but I think in the case of, of um, uh, Messer Gill won't be because he has such an extraordinary tale and life to tell. But let's start at the beginning. Um, I want to... to uh, pick up his entrance, if you like, into Australia uh, and South Australia, but where was he born and what were his circumstances? He was born in Somerset in England in 1818. His father was a Baptist minister. Uh, his mother was a teacher. So he's brought up in that sort of Portmouth, uh, Cornwall area, uh, received his education at home schools. Uh, then he worked at the William Seabrook Academy then worked in a framer's shop, which is a very wonderful way to actually get experience in what's happening in art, and ended up working in a profile studio uh, in London, where he was painting scenes and touching up various details. By the age of 21, two of his siblings had died from probably an outbreak of the smallpox. And just before Christmas in 1839, the 21-year-old Samuel Thomas Gill arrived in South Australia. And as you may recall, South Australia has only been Hang on, going. I'm not going to let you get too ahead of yourself. Sorry. Um, <laughs> tonight I'm leading the dance. All right. Um, back in my box. So he was trained. He was uh, trained as an artist? Sort yeah. of? Yes. Yes, we don't know too much about his training. Um, both parents ran finishing schools for, for... Young, for young gentlemen. Oh. And What's a finishing for... school for a young gen... I know one for a woman. What's it, one for young gentlemen? What do they learn? Talk to you about later. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, ba basically, this is essentially private tuition. Uh, although the schools, according to one report, there were about 300 students. Some of them sort of living there in a sort of a dormitory. Oh. And they also had regular art classes. Now, as far as we know from family papers, uh, Sam, or he was known Thomas in the family because his father was also called Samuel, uh, Thomas was basically studying in the home school, uh, and then he gained employment with a picture framer. So he, so he had facility. I mean, he, he had, had some training yes. and he clearly had facility. You, you can just see from looking at the absolutely, work absolutely. that you know, he I mean, did. He, and people simply say, well, Looking at his earliest work, which we have in the exhibition, which dates from back in England uh, when he was 19 years old, uh, he's just got a, he's a virtuoso mm -hmm. draftsman. Yes. And he's a sort of a, a descriptive draftsman. Uh, he's not a, an academically trained artist. Okay. So he's not like a William Strutt. And so he um, clearly had these tragedies in his family and, you know, wouldn't have been the most prospect-filled place where he was living. So was that what drove him onto a, onto a boat and to be a free settler in Australia? Well, he went with his family. All the family migrated. There was his father, his mother, his, old, his younger brother and his younger sister. And they all came out together basically to start a new life in a colony that had just been established. Um, and this is south, in South Australia? This is in Adelaide, yes. Mm. And uh, he arrived, um, I think, 17th of December, 1839, and already just in the beginning of 1840, he puts an advertisement in the papers, more or less I'm saying, opening up rooms in Gawler Place in South Australia, and we'll do portraits, we'll do images of dogs, horses, 
family, estates, and I, works. I find that amazing, th this ad that he placed and the fact that he was so um, vigorous, if you like, and set up this studio straight away. He clearly had self-confidence and, uh, and he knew that he, could, that he would have a, a ready market there for, for such drawings? Well, probably he hoped he would and I'm not sure that he did because as far as we know, there's very, very few formal portraits that Gill did. Uh, there are a few that we can identify, and certainly he did some lithographs later, which were heads of people, lithographs. Um, but it seems that very early in the piece, he did not find a convenient sort of audience. And so Gill starts to do all sorts of commissions, like the streetscapes of Adelaide. And who's commissioning him? As far as we know, the editor of a local newspaper, the South Australian Register, someone called James Allen. Now, South Australia was undergoing a period of extreme labour shortage. So Allen had this mission of going back to England and using Gill's illustrations as sort of propaganda of how good life was in South Australia. And so when we see those wonderful glowing watercolours of about 1845, they really show Adelaide as it should be. Now, clean, beautifully uh, presented streets. Um, I'm assuming there's no Adelaideans here in the audience that are going to be offended by that. No, 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 no. I mean, listen, there's wonderful images of Rundle um, Street, for example, or Rundle Mall as it is now. Uh, it's basically, you know, hasn't changed. I mean, the, 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 yeah, the, 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 there's cars there. I mean, the only main difference I that, I, we're digging a hole. That, that, I, that I can actually detect <laughs> is um, in Gill's day, they didn't have constant roadworks. And for the last 15 years I've been going there, they've always been digging up parts of Rundle Mall. I can't understand why. I know, I know there's an uh, um, unemployment problem, but you know, there's sure, surely there's other strategies we could employ there. Let's, let's get it back on track. Um, sorry, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, just sort of branching off for a second, can we look at these works, and indeed possibly all of the works then that he created, are they, are they documentary evidence of Australia as it was, or are they idealised? Uh, they're both, and I think they change. I mean, Gill worked here for 41 years, so it's not a question that he's doing really the same thing all over the time. No, he does develop, he does think, and what, and the question that I want to pose is slightly different, is who is he making this art for? We'll get to that, because his audience is clearly a very yeah. I, I, huge part of, of what he does and, mm. and the audience that he creates and finds and, and what he does for them. I, I just want to know what kind of, at this stage, at this early stage when he and he's just landed up in Adelaide with his family, what kind of man is he? What, what do we know about the young man? Well, we know quite a lot about him, actually. Um, he was a very sociable person. He was uh, gregarious, he was popular. Uh, he's immediately so sort of picked up in society. Uh, he's referred to in newspaper columns. He becomes friends with people like John Eyre, uh, Sturt, uh, Horrocks, the explorers of South Australia. He becomes friends with some of the major landholders, uh, particularly the Angus clan. Uh, so, yes, uh, he appears to be a very, very well-adjusted man. He has, and this particularly attracts me to him, a love of dogs. Yes. Almost the first thing we find out about Gill, he lands in South Australia, and what does he do? Buys for himself a nice big dog, or a little pup that's going to grow into a big dog, a Newfoundlander. And this is about 1840, and we know the fortunes of what happens with that dog as well. So um, Gill is a person, and he's a, a natural horseman. He loves the bush, and right from the word go, we know that he goes out. He goes out in the Fleuria Peninsula, uh, where he spots his first corroboree. And there's images that he makes in 1842. So um, this bloke is prolific. Mm. It's not unusual for him to do three or four drawings a day. And so, as I was saying to you before, I've started a catalogue resume of Gill's exactly 25 years ago. And a couple of weeks ago, it ticked over the 3,000 mark. Uh, which is not that unusual because someone like George Cruikshank has 12,500 images. And, so, and because he was so prolific, we have to assume that there were, you know, you know at least three times that Absolutely, made. absolutely. Yes. Because the, the thing is, and he's never been a very expensive artist. And unfortunately, um, expense and longevity are linked together. In other words, if someone buys uh, an expensive oil painting, there's a greater chance that they'll hang on to it rather than someone 
buys what we call, if you like, democratic multiples, whether they be watercolor <laughs> sketches or lithographs, and there's this tendency of saying, I oh, will pin them to the fridge type thing, and they remain there and the light comes in and so on. What's interesting about him in this early period, and clearly as you describe this young man who slips into his new environment so readily, is that like the early settlers of Australia, he was ad adventurous. He had a, a real adventurous spirit. He was adventurous, but I'm not telling you one rather crucial detail. Shortly after he arrived in South Australia, his mother and his sister both die. Father remarries, and the boys... Sam and uh, John Ryland Gill, his brother, don't get on with their stepmother. So in other words, they're pretty well looking after themselves. Dad gets an allotment of land uh, outside of Adelaide, about 40k out. And so the Gill boys start to branch out mm. and live in town. And he does actually do so many things uh, that is almost dizzying. There's this frenetic pace of activity. Uh, and we've got to track Gill fairly closely because the, he is, has a public profile, so the idea that he sort of um, is invisible in society is not accurate. Uh, he's a highly visible character, and we can simply say, oh yes, in this month he was in this place here, a month later he's there, and so on. So we've actually got a pretty good map, and from there we can go backwards and to sort of date his work. What were the key works of this early period? Well, the one I particularly enjoy is the Horrocks Expedition which occurred in 1846. Am I allowed to talk about that? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> now, the Horrocks expedition, now that you've asked about it, it was a remarkable expedition for two reasons. Firstly, it was the first expedition where a camel was employed for the exploration of interior Australia. And secondly, it was pretty well the only expedition that I'm aware of where the camel actually shot the explorer. So it's pretty well, you know, camels won, explorers yet to score. <laughs> and um, Horrocks was the uh, same age as Gill. They came out the same year. Uh, they obviously had a strong friendship. And he set out to look for more pasture. And Gill kept a diary, and the diary survives. And he produced 33 watercolours on this um, journey of exploration. And Horrocks was a man of his own times, you know, just typical English explorer. Every time he saw anything interesting, he would shoot it and bag it. Um, you know, just, uh, they haven't changed much now. <laughs> and as that's, he, that's the way they rolled, yes. Absolutely, that's the way it goes. And it just happened to be that Horrocks saw what sounds like a, an attractive-looking parrot. So he just was loading his shotgun when the um, camel, his name, by the way, was Harry, now that you inquired. So Harry lurched. The shotgun went off in Horrocks' face, and he lost part of his head and part of his hand, and spent the next few days dying, and Gill nurses him. But all of that sort of chronology is sort of uh, beautifully depicted in these gorgeous watercolours, uh, some of which are in this exhibition. They are, they are very beautiful watercolours. So when we're looking at sort of highlights, what particularly I'm drawn to in the South Australian years is his attitude to Indigenous Australians. I think he arrives as a 21-year-old with all the prejudices of an Englishman of that time. You know, this is a person who basically is looking at these Stone Age people um, living in the sunset of the years, encountering a superior civilization, and about to pop off. Uh, after a very short period of time, Gill is spending time with Indigenous people. He is observing how they hunt, how they go about their everyday life, and how they live in harmony with the environment. And one of the most remarkable things that emerges in this year is that Gill actually emerges as a Koori lover. He's a person who's very, very strongly identifying, and in some works quite literally, identifying with the indigenous people in South Australia, then later Victoria and New South Wales. There's a, um, well, there are a number of um, pieces in the exhibition. Has anyone here seen the exhibition yet? Can I have a show of hands? Okay, oh, all right, so virtually almost everyone in the room, which is terrific. Um, the, the piece which has, um, which is, is almost a retrospective piece, so it's painted from, uh, imagined from 1788, and uh, uh, the Indigenous figure is marked as, is it Lord of All He Surveys, something like that? Water. Yes. Monarch, monarch of all that he surveys. All that yes. he surveys. And there's an extraordinary poignancy and, and irony 
to that. Uh, it's, it's remarkable for how early that work is done. I mean, Gill basically um, is pretty direct in his social commentary, and a lot of people find that social commentary increasingly uncomfortable. But I mean, that we can speak about that a bit later. But I think one of the, these two things that emerge in the South Australian years, one is Gill more or less starts to embrace indigenous people, the indigenous lifestyle, and the way they live in harmony with their environment, which is something that he finds very different from what's happening with Europeans coming to Australia. And the other thing is, Gill starts to paint Australia not an English uh, landscape. And possibly because he wasn't that well trained. He wasn't like, a, say, a John Glover who came with a formula yes. and then could adapt it. Uh, Gill was actually looking at things and suddenly he's observing things much more precisely, flora, fauna, but particularly you'll notice the conditions of light. So those very, very early images of the um, labours of the months and the seasons, you still have that sort of lightness of coming to grips with the Australian light where a lot of the imagery and traditions are English and then he gradually moves into things like the Gawler River image of 1844 mm -hmm. where it's undeniably Australia and Australian um, eucalypts, uh, Australian conditions of light, the self-pruning trees and all those sorts of things. So that sort of apprenticeship, and we're talking about an artist aged in his 20s, so it's pretty good going. So when did he make the move um, from Adelaide to Melbourne? Well, basically that was forced upon him. Now, I'd like to say, of course, that he saw the light, realised that he was wasting his time there, and came to the New Jerusalem of the Southern Hemisphere, Melbourne, and that's perfectly reasonable. But because it, it was true. Absolutely, absolutely. It, but it was. It was, absolutely, It yes. was uh, yeah. uh, the second only to London in terms of population, wealth and, and yeah. finery. But the problem is that virtually all the male population of South Australia saw the same light <laughs> and they all came over to Victoria, to the Victorian goldfields. And essentially for an artist who depends on patronage, uh, there was no patronage. Gill had gone through a period of insolvency. He had some, some health issues. So... I think by about March of 1852, uh, he's here, and already in the sort of autumn, winter of 1852, he's working on the gold fields. He's spending a lot of time in Ballarat, in Bendigo, and what is now Castlemaine. And what's he doing on the gold fields? How is he plying his tray there? I think there's no evidence that he ever looked for gold. Um, some people say, well, listen, he observed things so closely, he must have known uh, what was going on. Possibly. Uh, uh, I'm not making a big issue about it. But this whole idea of that he was one of these people who went to search in search of gold, then realised he could do, make a better living by depicting what he saw, uh, probably is a bit of a myth. What Gill starts to do, and this is very, very interesting, he doesn't actually show the typical imagery of the gold fields. You know, these happy diggers calling, shouting out El Dorado as they stand with these big nuggets of gold. That sort of imagery that we associate with the early gold fields, you don't find any of that in Gill. Gill instead starts to, if you like, present the psychology of being there. Uh, images of what is happening. I mean, he starts to do very unpopular things like uh, images of racism on the gold fields. Yes, there's a particular image that I know is, um, means a great deal to you. Just talk about that one when it comes to racism. Well, a um, couple of images, because I know that today, in 2015, it's absolutely unthinkable. But back then, there were right-wing xenophobic politicians <laughs> who were trying to whip up hysteria, and I quote exactly, about boat people coming from Asia. And they were coming here to steal our gold and our jobs. And there was a lot of hostility directed. And these boat people were basically Chinese, coming here as indented labourers. Now, Gill was one of the very, very few artists who actually took the cause of the Chinese, who came out and simply said, no, well, listen, these are hard-working people. They're the diggers from China and show them as such. And there's one image that I, yes, I, I think particularly, there's several images actually, all clustered together in the exhibition, but one of them is called Might versus Right, where we see a group of Anglo-Irish thugs 
beating up a group of Chinese miners. One of the very first race riots in the country. Yes, and, and also then there's the images of the um, you know, things you always wanted to see, what a Chinese takeaway looked like in the mid-1850s. John Alou's Chinese restaurant, Main Road, Ballarat, 1855. I think it's still there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And I was there last week. And, you know, <laughs> it's, it, I think it's a place, actually, it's got slight changes. I think it's opposite where the art gallery is. There's a Chinese takeaway there. Nothing much changed. Uh, and I look very carefully at the, the main chef. And I think he's the same one that's uh, in Gil's picture, but possibly generationally, but very, very similar. But, you know, you've got this sort of image of multicultural harmony occurring in Ballarat. Gill's actually making the point uh, that many, many uh, writers and diarists on the goldfield make, but we don't actually see in art, except in Gill. For example, he represents women on the goldfields. Uh, he represents the uh, environmental catastrophe on the goldfields. He's showing quite frequently what people could refer to as the, the dark side of the gold rushes. Um, the impact it has on indigenous peoples, the impact it has on the flora and fauna. But these are some of the themes that start to emerge quite strongly in Gill's art. That's, so not, a, that's not a projection by us onto him? No, no, no. no? It's like the, the might versus right. I mean, he actually writes up inscriptions so we can't actually get it wrong. And I, th I think that's a very, very important point. Um, what I discovered in my um, engagement with STG was that he seems to operate on a number of levels. The first level is that is sort of the Andy Warhol wow factor. You look at it and say, wow. And the second level when you look and say, oh, wait a second, I think actually this is about something else. Mm. And he'll give us text guidance there, images, and then if you keep on looking closely enough, you suddenly pick up on all sorts of visual clues that you'll find out that he's actually quite a profound thinker and what seemed to be like a, a slight anecdotal little image is in fact many tiers of possible meaning. Now, running as a thread through our conversation this evening clearly will be the issue of his audience and him finding his audience, creating it, um, servicing it. Who's his audience in the goldfields? Who is he selling to? Unlike South Australia where his audience is quite clearly England, the mother country, uh, in the gold fields, it's local, and we know this. Why? He produces his earliest sketches, uh, dated in June, July, 1852. Then he produces a series of 48 lithographs printed here in Melbourne in, in uh, Collins Street uh, between August and October of 1852, and they printed in thousands of copies, literally thousands of copies. Uh, we know they reprinted, they're disseminated all over the place. And then there's yet another very interesting level of this, letterhead paper. And this is what happens before there were postcards. So one of his lithographic images uh, is translated into an engraving, is put on this sheet of paper, <laughs> taking the top part of the paper, mm. and it's a fourfold sheet where people would actually write and relate of what's going on in the picture, very much like, you know, when you're writing back from saying, yes, I visited Pisa, yes. and this is what I saw, and this is like it or not like it or whatever. And, and they would have a choice of images to select from? Absolutely, absolutely, okay. because we've got advertisements, we know which ones were transferred into letter paper, you know, for example, the convivial diggers in Melbourne okay, celebrating, yeah. that particular image is translated, the license inspector's image is translated. <laughs> so all of those things get out, and basically, uh, to justify a sabbatical, uh, I could go off to some remote and unpleasant and unfriendly place like the Bodleian in Oxford and look at the bunches of letters we have coming from Australia mm. on Gill letterhead paper and read back in what actually is going on. You and how should people do felt that. I and did, you should, I did, I did. You should take me with you if you sort of, you know, idea. do another little uh, visit back. Okay. Um, so An another thing to be discussed later. <laughs> later. So the, the sets of lithographs that you described earlier, though, um, who's interested in those? Is, is this a growing middle-class audience that wants to be informed of what's going on in the gold fields? Well, listen, yes and no, because firstly, the idea that the diggers who came out here were some sort of... Um, illiterate low life, well, we've long rejected that. These people were actually quite uh, well read. Uh, they, cons they consume newspapers, and they consume these images as information, as commentary, and we know they're buying them. 
There, there's also a system of, uh, of self-pride. People want to say, well, listen, this is exactly how I did this. This is where I was. Mm. So you've got this sort of notion of um, preserving of self in art. And so, yes, um, at this stage, um, his lithographs are being commissioned locally. They're being sold uh, through news agents, through stationery stores, as they were called then. And uh, we do know that the circulation in considerable numbers. He exhibits his watercolours. He exhibits them in the uh, front of um, music shops. Uh, he exhibits them in hotels. There's colo intercolonial and colonial exhibitions. Gill's very active in them. And there's also th such things as uh, auctions and uh, lot art lotteries. Gill is also showing in all of those things as well. And uh, at this point, that, that, was, that sort of set of work that you're speaking of, are people buying them and keeping them, or are they, are they ephemeral, are they discarded? Listen, they were not expensive, and so they're both. People uh, literally use them because we have images of people pinning them up in their dwellings, very much like they did for images of the English caricatures, you know, people like... Um, Hogarth or Gilray. So like sticking Robinson. it to your fridge. Yeah, it's, it's like we put a Bruce Petty or a Lunick uh, on, on, the on, fridge. on the fridge. Uh, they're used for that purpose. They're sent overseas as commentaries or between friends. And some people do actually start to keep them. So that by 1869, mm. uh, the State Library of Victoria or the Melbourne Public Library as it was then known, uh, decides to commission Gill to actually repeat these images as uh, these glorious watercolours for the collection because people realise that this is not only um, an example of art but this is actually example of history, history, our history. It's history that needs to be preserved, the social commentaries, how it was then, these become all very, very important parts of the agenda uh, for institutions. What was the Australian sketchbook of 1864? The Australian sketchbook is um, just going on your chronology. Gill in 56 made an error of judgment. Even I have to say, I'm a great defender of Gill, but he made an error of judgment. She was very beautiful, she was red-haired, and he eloped with Sound her. Sound like an error to me. Yeah, no, well he, no, th that wasn't the error. The error was that he actually uh, went north of the Murray and settled in Sydney, where, and, he, and it took him about, thanks, it took him about eight years to realize that this wasn't going to work out. And so the Australian sketchbook is executed immediately on his return to Victoria um, in the early months of 1864, and it's um, published uh, probably in 1865, although some of the images are from 64. It, in many ways, summarizes a whole philosophy of life. Now, I have to share with you one very important revelation. One of the most important things that Gill achieves during his life is to give visual expression to a new species of Homo sapien, the Aussie digger. Tough, resilient, resourceful, true to their mates, rather dubious about authority, institutionalized religion. There's the women, and there were men like that as well. <laughs> now, Gill long before the bulletin days, before the great artists like Phil May or people in, much closer in our time like Russell Drysdale, gives visual expression to this typical Aussie form, men and women. And that's very, very important to stress. It's nothing to do, I mean, diggers, where the word diggers come from? Nothing to do with, of course, Gallipoli and the militaristic uh, myths of that period. No, is the diggings and diggers as they are in 1852. So Gill is actually giving expression to this new Australian type. And the Australian sketchbook is really uh, when he brings them all together. Now, in some ways, you could say it's a sentimentalized image. Uh, it's where there's truth in country living, truth in rural Australia, these are the values. And Gill is very much a rural person. He's a great horseman. He loves horses. He loves dogs. He spends a lot of time there. When he gets into trouble, it's because he goes to town. Um, and it's very much a celebration of what it is to be Australian. And the, some of the images are strong images, like a bush funeral. Uh, but Gill, again, when you first see it, it's, it's sort of a, 
there's a, a wagon bringing in a body for burial, then you look at the various multicultural cast that Gill assembles there. And then at a side, near the hut, there's a woman <coughs> holding a small child in her arms. That's the new generation taking place of the one that's passing. And although it's a bleak winter landscape, when you look very closely in the foreground, there's a little spring flower coming out. That's a sort of symbolism of regeneration, faith in the bush ethos of rural Australia. How would we characterise or how would you characterise his, um, his style and his art and his approach to his craft at this stage? It's a bit difficult to actually <clears throat> pin it down. Gill is a natural draftsman, but he is, like most great draftsmen, he's awkward. He hasn't got a, he's not a facile draftsman. There's a certain awkwardness about his figures, and I think that's one of the wonderful qualities about him. They sort of fought out. He is a miniaturist. He puts in so much information mm. that when you look at one of those gills, it's basically the size of a postcard, and yet enormous amount of detail, information included in it. So Gill is, in some ways, the first painter of modern life that we have in Australia. I don't like expressions like a pictorial journalist, because I think uh, in the way we use that term, is something like slightly negative about it. And he's not an illustrator. I don't take it that way, then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <coughs> okay. Talk about that later. Um, the, the whole thing about it, Gill um, tries to actually observe and interpret yes. and give it a visual form. Yeah, there's an interpretation to it, clearly, So, which, clearly which mean, he, means he's not a journalist. He's he, not a journalist no. in the sense of... He's, he, and, and by the way, the, people are simply saying, oh, you're basically, Gill was only good because there, were, there weren't cameras invented at that stage, to which I say, well, that's actually rubbish. Gill was the first person to import a camera into South Australia, but, and, but he found it a very limiting medium. Because, I mean, if, if I was going to take a photograph of Virginia, in this light would be, what, one two hundredth? 250th of a second, and that's how much attention she gets from me with, with a snap of a camera. Now, if I was asked to draw her, it would be a disaster. But if I was asked to draw her, it may take an hour or two. So you're actually observing, commenting, adding to it. And Gill's images have this sort of wealth of detail. Mm. Observe detail, but there's also these tiers of interpretation, levels of commentary, and it takes a long time to sometimes actually understand what's going on. And I won't claim that I've you know, cracked the code of a lot of them. A lot of images, as you know, when I've spoken about them, I'd simply say, I don't really know what's going on here. What are those stick figures doing in the background? Or what's happening here or there? Uh, Gill gives us a lot of clues. Sometimes it'll be months later that I finally say, ah, oh, got it. Technically, what's he working with at this stage? I mean, his, his drawings, and you say, as you say, they're so tiny and so packed with detail. Very, very fine, fine brushwork, fine drawing work. He's a watercolorist, uh, and his watercolor techniques change because he starts adding body to him, gum arabic to it, and then surface layers to it. He works in washes, watercolor washes, and uh, pen and ink washes. He works in most drawing mediums. He works in lithographs. He works in engravings. And he also works in relief prints. So he's a graphic artist. Mm. We know that he experimented with oils at one stage and didn't like the medium and rejected it. Probably from a marketing perspective, that was a very, very bad mistake. Because certainly by the 60s and 70s, um, the Australian taste in art had changed for these romanticised, glowing images of the landscape, people like Louis Bouvelot. And I'm not basically saying dismissing Bouvelot. I think Bouvelot, at his best, is a very, very fine artist. But Gill did not go along that path. Gill remained in these sort of social commentaries. He f believed very strongly that the role of the artist is to engage with society. Mm. And that's what he does as his first calling. He engages with society, comments on that society, uh, sometimes um, with a bit of humour as well. W was he a frustrated fine artist? W would he have wanted to be that person had he the skill? I think that concept, uh, as far as we're aware, existed. 
because he, he well, firstly, we've got very limited writings from Gill. Um, but this idea of art as information as separate from art as a useless aesthetic object, that distinction is not that clear. I mean, yes, of course, it's, I mean, you, as an art historian, you realize that's been going since the Renaissance, but in fact, say, in colonial society, the distinction isn't clearly drawn. People bought, say, a panoramic view of Melbourne or Sydney simply because uh, it was a panoramic view beautifully depicted. Gill could do that, Conrad Martins could do that, uh, Louis Bouvelot probably couldn't do it, but he would try to. Uh, so anyway, um, I don't think there was, there was a question of Gill being frustrated as a fine artist, but lacking the skills or the patronage to achieve this. No, Gill was basically working in that tradition of, of Hogarth's graphics, uh, Gill Ray, um, going through to Rollins and Cruikshank and so on. That is the tradition that he communicates to Australia that is the tradition that people who were art knowledgeable recognise in his work, commentaries which we have published in the press, compare him to Cruikshank, compare him to, to Fizz, another sort of caricaturist of that time. Uh, and that's the tradition in which he's working. He's not seeking to break out of it. He doesn't do this as his bread and butter work, whereas he's aspiring to do something else. So in the aftermath of the Australian sketchbook of 1864 and the work that he does, how is he regarded at this point? What's, it, what's his um, fame, if, if there is well, such a thing? Gill is essentially lionised by certain sectors of society, um, people like Marcus Clarke, uh, his friends. He obviously has some friends in high places. Redmond Barry, for example, is a crucial supporter and must have been behind the commissioning in 1869 of the um, Goldfield sketchbook, one of the great treasures of the State Library that's on display in this exhibition with a page turner next to it. So Gill does have some, a, a patronage base. He is being supported, he is being looked after, but it's probably not broad enough. It's starting to narrow. Because people in the 70s or late 60s, um, they basically didn't want to be reminded of where the money came from. They didn't want to be reminded about the grit and the blackness of what was happening on the gold fields. It's almost like a few generations earlier, people didn't want to be reminded of their convict origins. Yeah, okay, it happened, but you know, let's not talk about it. Uh, you know, don't mention the war. And basically, uh, Gill kept on, if anything, becoming a little bit more strident in his criticism. I think he was, in some ways, a frustrated democratic socialist and republican who had very strong views of what was going on. And what I personally find quite frightening, and I'm not frightened by many things, is that 135 years after his death, the issues that he was fighting against are still with us in Australia. And that's why in 2015, when we look back at Gill and questions of, say, refugees, racism, environmental issues, all of those things, they're still are sort of with us now. And um, in that way, uh, STG was very, very contemporary. We're sort of hurrying towards his, um, his death, if you like, because there's no avoiding it in, in this conversation, but we've got about 15, 10 years, I guess, between now and when that happens. What's he doing in that period? Is he, is he becoming more and more of this strident um, political commentator, if you like, that you describe? I think he was a political commentator. He was working for architects because his skills were admired. He's doing uh, sort of very detailed building drawings, projections of what buildings will, would look like. He's doing illustrations for the black and white press. Uh, he's getting some commissions and he's missing out on others. Um, Gill's economic fortunes were never very good. I mean, he was insolvent several times. He never had great financial success? No. Uh, I mean, people in the family, for example, there is a family tradition. They simply say he was a very bad manager of money. That may or may not be true. Um, the problem with Gill's papers is that um, he had no known offspring. His brother did in Adelaide, so the papers remained in that part of the family, but they were all destroyed in the bushfire of 1835. Mm. So what we have is um, one of his brother's descendants writing a bit of a biographic account on Gill based 
on these now lost papers. So that, that, that's why I'm sort of humming and hawing of how accurate these are. And it's very much written in this sort of normal, uh, deifying tone. Um, Gill was born and the, the son appeared and everyone realized he was a genius and so on. Um, so it's difficult to actually um, pinpoint exactly what's going on, but one of the points made in the family papers is that he was an appallingly bad manager of money. Did he enjoy himself hugely? When he had money, he spent it. Was he, was he given to wild and crazy times or excess? We don't know enough about that. We've got descriptions of uh, some parties he threw, uh, particularly in Adelaide. What were they like? Um, well, just before he departed on the Horrocks expedition, he more or less got all his mates together and um, they sang songs, celebrated, um, and endlessly sort of delivered toasts until the toast became less and less um, understandable. And a few days later, when they recovered, they set off on the exp exp expedition. <laughs> Nothing uh, has changed. No, no, not, 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 <laughs> much, not much has changed as far as that's concerned. But no, um, Gil, and the point that you may be tactfully moving towards Gil and his drinking, um, there's no real evidence. I mean, there's people do make comments that he drank to excess. Uh, undoubtedly, he did. But then when you go through the criminal courts, uh, he isn't ever sort of arrested for drinking. His brother is once, uh, but that's about it. Um, and whether we can read into images of convivial diggers and improvident diggers celebrating wildly in Melbourne as being something autobiographical, I don't know. Mm. Because if we do, then we have to go in all areas. But what's important about Gill is that he, he's not a moralist. He's not a person who stands on a soapbox and saying, like his father, you know, I condemn you and you'll go to hell and whatever. He, more than not, frequently, when you look at the, say, self-portraits in the exhibition, he laughs at himself. He puts himself as an object of ridicule mm. rather than saying, well, yes, I'm part of that sort of rather piteous and humorous part of humanity uh, that I'm depicting in my pictures. He depicts himself as a bit of a vagabond, really. A bit of a vagabond, a person who's a bit of a non-hoper. Yes. And, and in the, the hero image used in this exhibition, where and the cutout as you enter the exhibition, basically has got Gill um, taking his shoes off so that he can sort of... Paddle in the water. Paddle in the water. He's holding a foldy in one hand, boots in the other and a pipe. Uh, and two of his Aboriginal friends are sort of trying to tell him something. And he's looking and saying, hello, how are you? And what they're trying to tell him is that the black, black snake's about to bite him in the foot. <laughs> and uh, just to add to the comic situation, there's a magpie above him about to unload as well. <laughs> so Gil puts himself in that situation of sort of slightly... And a great sense of humour. A great, great sense of humour. And that's why, thank God, the dogs are following us all around. The, dog, the dogs I want... I have to say that we mentioned... or well, you mentioned the Renaissance in passing, but whenever I see the dogs in St. Gil, I always think of Tintoretto and the fact that he always has... Um, the pride of place in a Tintoretto painting is will be a dog. Even when Jesus Christ himself is there, there'll be the dog in the foreground. And that absolute understanding of, you know, uh, the, the frailty of all humanity, even divinity. And uh, St. Gill's doing something similar, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. No, I, th I think he uses dogs as a sort of a commentary for the picture behind us doing the block mm. at Great Collins Street. It's this sort of great freeze of people going down Collins Street. The block was between Elizabeth and Swanson Street. Um, it's a time for promenading. Uh, the men and the women would dress up and look at one another. And Gill's comment, which has been tactfully cropped from this image behind yes. us, is <laughs> two dogs in the... The dogs are about two, here. Yeah, right in the middle, <laughs> in the foreground, there's two dogs sniffing one another. Uh, Gill has that sort of humour, but he is, is a, a tradition that Hogarth uses, if you think of this sort of uh, cats covering up their faces in shame in the Rake's Progress, for example. And Gill's very much in, within that tradition of using animals to comment on what actually is happening in the main uh, image. Did he find personal happiness? I know he's estranged from his brother, um, but did he find romantic or, or personal happiness? As far as we know, he married um, and was estranged from his wife, then eloped with Elizabeth, who then was called Mrs. Gill, and they lived in Stanley Street in Woolmaloo for about seven years, and then that seems to have broken up. We know that Elizabeth remains in Sydney, where she then calls herself uh, Mrs. E. Gill, 
and she remains for the next two decades. We can trace her being. Gill returns back to Australia, so back to Australia, back to Melbourne, and um, we don't really know very much about his personal circumstances. Certainly, um, late in his life, he seems to have been largely a loner, and there's very little evidence that he was actually married or, or living in some sort of relationship. So why did he die, and you can describe the way he died, so um, unknown and unlamented? Well, firstly, um, let me relate the chronology. Gill had gone to see a friend of his in Bank Place. This is on the 27th of October, 1880. And he wasn't feeling very well, and so his friend said, oh, listen, don't worry, come back tomorrow, you can work on the drawings then. Then Gill was walking from Bank Place, up there, uh, to a block away from the State Library where another one of his friends lived, a monumental stonemason, and for some reason um, decided to go and check mail at the GPO in Melbourne, in the corner of Burke Street, and suffered from a heart attack and died on the steps. If you want to give a bit of a context, it's about the same time as Redmond Barry was pronouncing a sentence of Ned Kelly. Totally irrelevant, but I thought I'd just chuck that in anyway. Now, it was true that when he died, uh, he wasn't recognised for about six hours. But only six hours. By the evening of his death, they'd found um, who he was, his address, but he had no next of kin living in Melbourne. There was a post-mortem carried out, on the body, and as the body wasn't claimed by family, he was buried in a pauper's grave in the Melbourne General Cemetery, where he remained for quite a number of years until he was reburied, thanks to the efforts of the Victoria History Society. Now, common mythology that arose at a time of romantic myth-making, um, that Gill was this genius artist of the colonial era, who was then brought down by the demon drink and died as a useless drunk in the gutter. That sounds like a story put about by the Rechabites. Absolutely, absolutely. And it was. I mean, a well-meaning um, registrar of the University of Melbourne basically published the story and gathered a few myths around it. And basically that was recycled time and time again and goes into some of the classics of Australian art, like Bernard Smith. And so... This has became one of the bedrock facts of Gill's biography. The only little problem with it, it's not really terribly significant, it's totally untrue. But apart from that, you know, it's a good story. Now, why is it untrue? Two reasons. Firstly, that when you look at this exhibition, you'll see some of the best work in this exhibition was executed in 1880, like this one behind me, three months before his death. He was not a hopeless alcoholic, that he was described to be, who couldn't hold a brush uh, and was totally useless. No, he was working at the peak of his powers. So listen, all of you, there's hope for you yet. You do, you do get better as you get older. And Samuel Thomas Gill was one of those. And the other, the other bit of evidence, which I just throw in because I just thought it would be appropriate, I do have the post-mortem. And his liver was in pretty good state. And he died of um, basically a aortic aneurysm. He was, uh, he was on uh, heart medication, he was, wasn't he? He was on yeah. blood pressure medications yeah. from the hospital anyway. Uh, he was 62 years old. His brother died at the age of 63. Dad died at the age of 60. Uh, Mum died at the age of 54. So it's a family that had this sort of heart problem running through it. So essentially he died within Cooey of what was a pretty reasonable innings for those times within that family tradition. So I'm not trying to really rehabilitate Gill. I'm not interested in that at all, um, or his biography or his personal life. But the point that I'm very, very important to make is that Gill's late work is actually some of his best work. He's not an artist who had this romantic temperament, so said the best things he could by the time he was 23, 24, and then basically spent the rest of his life repeating himself. Uh, that is a myth, and that's wrong. Uh, 
what his personal habits were, I don't honestly know. I mean, we've got quite a bit of information about him. He certainly was incredibly prolific, a frenetic bout of activity mm. right through to the end of his life. He had to, to survive, but his audience was disappearing. Uh, he was less of an artist in demand, and um, some of the works that he does create late in life are these very introspective, philosophical, quite gorgeous pieces, I think. And we're very, very fortunate to actually have them all around us in the exhibition downstairs. Listen, yes, uh, he did work um, as ghost artist. The most uh, famous example is the uh, J.D. Doyle sketchbook, where it was a tradition where he would be um, an art, in this case it was a medico, a quack, who basically asked for Gill to work up drawings. In the end, Gill just put in his own, because uh, Doyle's own drawings, of which there are a number, are appalling. And so, and they're all signed um, by Doyle, as the Doyle sketchbook, but then Gill very, very secretively, he had an ego, all artists do, and in many of these drawings, in disguised areas, he put in his initials, SDG, just in case anyone missed it. Did he work for the uh, print media under a different name? Not that I'm aware of, but, but, and this is an important but, he was mercilessly plagiarized and ripped off. And so that um, quite often we discover that artists in England would just be copying Gill and presenting it as their own work. Some would even write whole accounts of experiences on the gold fields, never having been to Australia, just describing what they saw in Gill's lithographs. And I have enormous pleasure in pointing out to my wonderful friends, French curators of art, that their great artist, Gustave Doré, ripped off my S.D. Gill. And they immediately say, oh, it's not possible. No, this is Doré. And I simply say, well, here's the evidence, mate. Here's my gills and here's your Doré. And, and uh, your Doré is basically ripping off my gill. I say, oh, this is, and, you know, basically after the fluster and things, it passes off saying, yes, even the great Doré uh, ended up copying gill that he took out of illustrations of the rambles at the Antipodes book. For such a um, cheeky, as you say, and provocative artist, I think that's a really nice note on which to end a little bit of an up yours to the, uh, to the, uh, <gasps> the countries back home. Will you please um, thank Professor Sasha Christian. An audience on your behalf, could you please thank Virginia Trioli, who has been up uh, traumatized at four o'clock in the morning. She survived all that and still has turned up and is with us today. Virginia, many, many thanks. Thank you.